morning. Good to see you, Emmanuel. Turn your Bibles to the book of James. We are starting a series called Screen Door on a Submarine. Anybody remember why we're calling it that? All right, we got one guy. <laughs> so Rich Mullins uh, is a singer-songwriter that I loved growing up, and he wrote a song uh, about faith. And in his song, he says, faith without works is like a song you can't sing. It's about as useless as a screen door on a submarine. And so I was like, I'm going to call a series on faith, a screen door on a submarine, because I love that, because obviously that's useless, right? And so as we start in the book of James, I wanted to kind of celebrate some things that were going on here uh, at the church before we get going. So obviously you just met our new student coordinator. His name is Cayman. He's an awesome guy. You know, when we hire our staff and when we look at candidates, we have these certain C's that we look for, right? Call, character, competency, culture. Are they a good fit? And came and checked all the boxes for us. And so we're really excited about having him. He also secretly told us that he does balloon animals, which is awesome. <laughs> and so guess what Cayman's doing in our fall festival? <laughs> balloon animals, yeah. And so I said, what kind of level are we talking about? Are we talking about like swords? Because I can do a sword. And he was talking about like elephant level. I was like, all right. Um, and so we'll see how he does. So judge him, judge him when he does it. No, so um, awesome. We also had our student ministry kick off this past Wednesday. Uh, and by the way, first time ever being in the student ministry at Emmanuel, you have an awesome student ministry. You really do. Praise God. That's rare. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the amazing volunteers, C group leaders. Pastor Luke did an amazing job the past few years. I walked in, I'm like, this is a great culture. Kids love being here. They love their leaders. They're being pointed towards Jesus. And so I just wanted you guys to know you have a wonderful student ministry that is on fire. And they played some sort of game. Students, are you in here? Some sort of like 007 game in here with a flashlight. And I was like, I used to be a youth pastor. I'm like, man, I wish I knew that game. It was awesome. And so uh, a lot of fun, a lot of good stuff happening there. We also, for those who have um, preschoolers, we have a beautiful new preschool room. Anybody drop their kids off there? Uh, you don't have to danger the steps and go to the dungeon anymore? Uh, no, but we have a wonderful student ministry and wonderful children ministry. We're excited about growing those ministries because we are a church that wants to invest in the next generation. We care about the next generation. Uh, and we are one generation away from the church no longer being here if we don't. And so we need to care. Amen? Here, here's another thing before we get going. Uh, we're doing a missionary survey. We're sending out emails to all of the missionaries that we support. 30-plus missionaries here. Again, awesome. And we're getting pictures back. It's kind of funny. Out in the mission wall, you see these kids that are like babies. And then the pictures come back, and they're like teenagers. You're like, okay. Okay, it's been a while. Um, but it's been really fun to see all the testimonies of our missionaries. We have wonderful missionaries all over the world doing amazing things. So we're just catching up with them, hearing their stories, and I think you should be proud of that. Lastly, we have our Fall Fest coming up in October. And just to give you a heads up, we're going to move into a culture here where we're going to do festivals, just like the early church did. I love how the early church had festivals. And I want to create a culture where we gather throughout the year and just be together. And not only be together, but extend that to our community to say that they're welcomed here. So Fall Fest is coming in October. And really, we're going to have food and blow-up toys and an axe. They, they bought this, like, axe-throwing, like, trailer, which is, like, I got dibs. I got dibs. But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have food after service. It's going to be from 12 to 3. It's going to be a lot of fun as a church. Um, okay, so have you turned to the book of James? All right, so I want to read... One verse in James, and then we're going to talk about it. So this gives you a, a context of where we're going here. So James 1.1, 1, 1, here's what it says. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve. So we're going to stop there, and we're going to talk about the book of James. We're going to lay the foundation for this series for the next eight weeks. So a couple things here. God is for you. This is going to be the message that James is going to try to tell us in the next eight weeks. God is for you, meaning... God is not a tyrant. He is not going to give you things to live your life according to that's going to hurt you. God's way, this is something that I want us to steal here because this is true. God's way is always better and always right. He is for you. And so James is going to say, listen, when you're in suffering, God is for you. When you have questions or concerns or you feel like he's distant, no, he's there. 
And in the context of this passage, what we see all throughout Scripture is, okay, God is for us. Not only that, but it says that he knows every hair in our head. That before we were born, he makes known the path to life. David says, you make known the path to life in your presence, every hair in my head. The thief comes only to just destroy, but you come to bring life. So all throughout Scripture, we hear from the disciples, listen, you may be going through a hard season in your life, but God is for you. He loves you. He's there for you. He has a plan for you. Have you let go? Have you given it to the Lord? Are you holding on? And if you let go, God is going to be faithful to carry you through those seasons. And in the end, he is victorious. So we talk a lot about the greatest story ever told. We are in the already, but not yet. Christ has already conquered death, and he's coming back victorious. The clouds will part. Every knee will bow. So we're in this amazing place as believers where we have this great hope that the world can't take from us, but yet we're in the world. So there's persecution and cancer and suffering and hurt and betrayal that we experience in this broken, fallen world. And God says, I am there and I am for you. And it says in Scripture, this is an amazing truth, that that in the Scripture there are two great messages that God wants to extend to us. The first message is this, salvation. God is saying, in the midst of the broken, fallen world, I have saved you from that world. So he gives us the gospel of grace. He says, in this, I have made a way for you to know me. You can't earn my relationship with your actions or your attitude or the amount of times you tend church. I have given you who I am in the person of Jesus Christ, God incarnate. So I have come down so that I could teach you not just to live this life trying to find the next temporary happiness. So he's saying, listen, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the job, the the, the new house, these are good things, but they're not the ultimate thing. In fact, Jesus says, I have come to show you a path that will lead you to the ultimate joy and the ultimate hope in your life. So this is the great misunderstanding about Christianity. Christianity is seen, especially as young people, as a restrictive faith. If you are a Christian, you can't do fun things. That's the lie of the enemy. In fact, what Jesus reveals to us is the path to ultimate joy. So so I get to present to you not a life of no's. I get to present to you if you follow the path that God's laid out for you, he is going to provide the ultimate joy and peace in your life. And the things of this world, if you chase those things, you will find temporary happiness at best. Amen? So Christianity is pointing you to ultimate joy, not away from it. I always say to people this, if you love this world, wait till heaven. Some of us think heaven is us floating around in clouds and will be boring. I would submit to you that all the things you love in life, all of them were created things. Think about that for a second. This is what James is going to make an argument for here about obedience. Listen, obeying Christ will bring you ultimate joy. You're not going to lose in believing what Jesus said and then walking according to what he calls you to walk to. You will gain because when you think about relationships, they are created things. So when you say, God, I'm going to treasure this relationship over the relationship with you, you choose less. Because you're choosing something that God created rather than the creator. You hear me? So the love you feel for your children The depth of that love is a created love by God who is love. So you're tasting the crumbs, but he says, I have the pie. Like, I have all of it for you. And so it's not you give up the things of this world. You gain the author of all that is good by pursuing him. You following me. So in scripture, there is salvation. The Bible is not about you. Again, this is going to be a theme in James. The Bible is not about you. You are not the hero. God is the hero. You are the rebellious, created person who is bearing the image of God, but is rebellion every day of your life according to the glory that he deserves. You hear me? You are the rebel. He is the hero. 
And in this story, we hear that the hero, despite our rebellion from the history of the beginning of mankind, we have rebelled, we've chased the things of this world over him, and he kept saying, they will fail you, but yet we believe they wouldn't, only to be failed. And the whole story of Scripture is God redeeming the rebellion of mankind by coming despite our rebellion, dying despite the fact that we didn't think we needed it, and extending grace to those who at one point in their life will realize, I have to step off the throne of my life. I need a Savior. And when they realize that, he has offered that to them. And so salvation is God's rescue story to us. And we have to remember that. That's why we're going to do communion today. We have to remember it's not about us. It's about what he did for us. We worship not because we want to worship. It's because he's worthy of worship and we are saved. We are saved people. We're not going to hold other people to some sort of idle standard because we recognize that everyone in this room, including me, are sinners in need of a Savior. So we're here because we all need Jesus. That's it. And so we hope that each other will help us to know God more because the more we know God, the more we experience the joy and the peace found in knowing God. So we are people who are yet to be saved, people who are saved and are being sanctified. And so he says the biggest thing in Scripture, and he's going to reinforce this all throughout the series in James, is that we are saved by grace. And he gets the glory because he is the hero. And here's the second thing, and it's also necessary. Obedience. You'll see in the book of James, he knows the path to life. And so when you see the things in scripture about God's standard for sexuality, God's standard for how to live your life and steward your life and your finances and your time and your energy, all of these things, you recognize that it's not a burden to obey those things. It's not a burden. It is a blessing to obey the things of God because he loves you. He says, you have the free will to do it your way, but my way is better for you. And so in the midst of that, think about your children. If I would say to you, hey, I got to, oh, church, I got to go play with my children today. Oh. That's obedience with a burden. But I get, I, get to, I get to play with my children today, church. I've been waiting all week for that. That's obedience because you're blessed. You see the difference? God, God, you, you taught me how to do this marriage thing? I was on my own. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the standards of, of what you created marriage for, to walk into, because without it, I'm blind. He says, no, no, obedience leads to life. It's a good thing to obey. And that's why faith and works are partnered. Because if you love Jesus, you will work towards loving him. So faith compels works. If you don't have faith, you will love yourself. Which means when the Bible says to do something that goes against your feelings, you will rebel because you don't love Jesus. You just like the idea of heaven. You hear me? You like the rewards of the gospel, but you don't like the substance of it. So faith and obedience are married because if you love him, you will obey what he calls you to do in your life. And so how do we know this? Okay, let's talk about James for a little bit. Who wrote the book of James? Brilliant. You're just <laughs> profound people. You inspired me with your biblical wisdom. So do you guys know who James is? Okay, James is the brother of Jesus. James is a half-brother, actually, of Jesus. And according to church history, um, if, you're, if you study James or you read any commentary, you'll find that James didn't believe Jesus was the son of God for the majority of Jesus' ministry. Did you know that? In fact, James and his siblings at one point wanted to kind of pull Jesus out of a crowd because they thought he was a little loco. But it makes sense. Think with me, okay? You have a sibling? Okay. Imagine your sibling all of a sudden is like, I'm the son of God. You're like, no, you're not. You're a little crazy. I'm the son. And then imagine you're like, okay, that's fine. You can be crazy with me. And then imagine the sibling goes out, I'm the son of God. You must eat my flesh. And they're like, no, this is actually. So James, James' sibling is like, okay, we got to get him out of there. 
which is one of the reasons I know the Bible is true, because that would be true. And they don't hide that in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? They don't hide the doubt of James. Because they're not hiding things from you. They're revealing that which is. But James is a half-brother. He doubts that his brother is the son of God. Makes sense. Do you know why James ended up being all in? You know what made James say? Okay, Jesus, you are actually the son of God. You are actually the Messiah. You know what it was? The resurrection. Okay. Logically, think with me. By the way, my faith, logic and reason led me to Jesus. The gospel is very logical. Makes sense to me. Do you know what made James believe Jesus? The resurrection. Okay, think with me. You have a brother, half-brother. I'm the son of God. Uh, You're really good. Like, you don't get in trouble a lot, but I doubt you're the son of God. Then he comes back from the dead. Okay. Seriously. Your sibling starts to walk after three days. Look. All right. James is like, I'm in. You are who you say you are. He's in. And not only that, but then we see this is the author. We see that his faith is based upon the resurrection of Jesus. By the way, ours is too. Why do we say the Bible says you need to trust the Bible? Why do we believe the Bible to be authoritative? Because the one who said it was conquered death. That's it. Jesus said it was, and he conquered death. I'm in. Why do we believe the Old Testament? Jesus believed the Old Testament and conquered death. I'm in. You hear me? It's based on the resurrection, not the authority of Scripture. It's powerful. Because Jesus said it was authoritative. And he was God. Only God could conquer death. So in this, we see James is all in. In fact, James then becomes martyred for his faith. For his half-brother, he was killed. And church history tells us, here's how he was killed. Because we... We, we, we make light of the context of James. A lot of the epistles, we think it's like people having, you know, lobster and they're just writing and having joy and comfortable and watching Netflix talking about Jesus. That's not the culture of the day. James was taking up to the top of the Temple Mount, church history tells us, and he's thrown off. He doesn't die. They get, they get a stick and they bludgeon him to death. This is how James died. All the while saying, my half-brother is the Lord, is the Messiah. I saw him come back from dead, so kill me. I'm not going to say that he wasn't because I saw him. He is. He's the Savior of the world, and he was bludgeoned to death, continuing to say that message. Jesus is the Savior. I don't know about you, but that makes a depth of trust in what he's about to say. No? Like, if you believe that the Bible is made up, this is a narrative, the Bible is made up by the disciples. They lied about it. What did James gain from being bludgeoned to death for a known lie? Anybody? If he lied, he would have known it was a lie. What did he gain from the known lie? The fruit of James' life says what he said happened. Do you, hear, do you hear the heart of what this book is going to give us? And when this man is going to talk about suffering, he suffered. Greater than you and I probably will. And when he talks about the joy found in suffering, he found joy in suffering. He's not making that up. He's not hoping that in your case it will be different than in his case. He found joy in suffering as he was thrown off the temple mount saying his half-brother was the son of God because he saw Jesus come back from the dead. Do you understand the context of the author? Okay. Background of the text, a little bit. We know that this is one of the earlier manuscripts in the New Testament, meaning this is one of the earlier manuscripts that we have access to. About 40, about 40s, like AD. There's no two or one at the beginning. It's 40s. Uh, We know that it's not really long after the stoning of Stephen when this letter was written. And just in context, when he's talking about the 12 tribes, what's happening here is we know in the Old Testament there was, what, 3,000 men saved roughly at Pentecost, right? And it was about 5,000 shortly after, and they're not including women and children. So you're looking at 20-plus thousand people that were saved and that were followers of Jesus. But we also see after the stoning of Stephen... The church was then persecuted after that in a a huge way. So the church scattered. 
Hence the tribes. They scattered because they were being persecuted. Great persecution was coming. We're talking people hung on crosses in the Roman roads that were their friends. And they were very much going to be after that. So it was tense within the church. And so James is writing to the people of God, the chosen people of God, and he's trying to encourage them. Again, they're being burned alive, church. They're being tortured because of who they say Christ is. And so he's writing to a church that is terrified that people will come in here, grab them, hang them on a cross, and no justice for them. No earthly justice was going to happen. And so he's writing them, and he's trying to encourage them. And he's saying to them, don't pursue the comforts of the world. Make sure that your faith is lived out. Trust in the one you say saved you. This is what he's trying to do to a church that is hurting. So how is the book broken down? If you're taking notes, here's some things. Chapter 1, we're going to talk about this in the next couple of weeks. This, this has to do with trials and perseverance. Doing the will of God regardless of what your conditions are in your life. So he's going to talk to a church that's suffering and say, keep doing the will of God. There are people that need to know about Jesus and you're not done yet. He's writing to people in this church who are older, who think I've done my time in ministry. And he's saying, no, you are not done. People that are struggling because they have a cancer diagnosis and they're just thinking about the day they're going to die in the next couple years and they're thinking, well, I'm just prepared to death. And he's saying, no, you're not done. God has something planned for you. Keep going. Keep being faithful. And they're saying, no, 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 we want to hide. He says, no, no, don't hide. God is with you. God is with you. Chapter 2, the relationship between works and deeds. He's saying, no, 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 if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, you will be working for his kingdom. It's not an option. So, like, that's why we're getting rid of the idea of volunteers in this church. Nothing in the scriptures tells you that you're volunteering in the church. You are the church. You don't volunteer. You are the body. You either obey or you disobey. You're either obedient to your Lord or you're disobedient to your Lord. There's no volunteering. This, this is the church. We are called to steward. You're either stewing it or you're disobeying. Give me your time, your energy, your resources. You're either obeying or you're not obeying. And that's not even between me. That's between you and the Lord. I'm hopefully going to convict you to say, no, I need to walk in obedience. But you need to say, no, no, actions are a result of the love you claim to have towards Jesus. Or I would say you need to question your salvation. You may not be saved. And, and the reason that's important is how dare us not say you may not be saved and you think you are only to die and go before the Lord and he says you're not. That's terrifying. So if you're not compelled to, to love and to serve and to make disciples and to be in your word, if that's not something that you're driven towards, you may not know the Lord. The Spirit of God may not be in you because that should be the fruit of the Spirit of God indwelling in your life. That's the byproduct of that. So do we know your heart? No. But if you don't love and do the things that God loves, we will question your salvation. Because God doesn't change his mind on his will. Make exceptions for you and your flesh. And then we're going to talk about chapter 4, warnings against, warn, um, chapter 3 is the taming of tongue chapter. Chapter 4 is the worldliness, not pursuing comfort and entertainment as your treasure. Okay, church, stop. It's not, not going to be a powerful sermon. Don't make comfort and entertaining your idol and your treasure, church. Holy cow. We got to listen to that one. No? How many Netflix shows do you watch a week? Come on. We don't, we don't need to hear that. Don't just be comfortable. God didn't call you to be safe and have a retirement and have a good house and to be comfortable. No, no, no. You were called for more. Don't get comfortable. You were called. We got to hear that one, don't we? Here's the last one we're going to talk about is a warning against trusting in those things. Chapter 5 is going to talk about trusting in the riches and the comfort. Be careful to trust in those things. One, they won't satisfy your heart. And two, they will let you down. They will let you down. So this is where we're going to go in the next couple weeks. 
But here's how this happens, okay? The church gets this letter. This is the context of, of, of what's happening during this time. The church is going to get this letter from James, and what would happen is, is the church would take this letter, and they would go to houses. They wouldn't have big facilities like this. They would go to small house ga- gatherings, maybe 10, 15 people, and they would have the letter, and they would have them all gather. Maybe they would have food ahead of time, and they would read the letter from start to finish. They would open up the letter, and they would read it out loud. And they didn't have a whiteboard. They didn't have PowerPoints. They didn't have a, a teacher who studied theology. They would just read the letter out loud. And the church would soak it in. Then they would go to the next house and they would read the letter out loud. And so this letter would be passed to all these houses and they would be read. And the people would just hear the word of God being read over them. And the greatest example I've seen recently of this is I was in China a few years back and I went to an underground church. And in the underground church they had one piece of paper. And I said, what's this piece of paper like? This is our study guide. And I look at this piece of paper, and there was five verses. The scriptures were out of context. <laughs> they weren't the right scripture. And they had a couple questions. And I said, how long did you have that? And they said, this is, this is for the year. So they had five verses that weren't even the proper verses. And so they ended up having to change it because they looked it up in their Bibles. And they had a couple questions for a year. And they just spent the year just reading that scripture, talking through it praying that God would reveal his truth to them. They didn't have access to what we have access to, even though some of us don't even use it. Forgive us, Lord. They had access to a little. They heard it read. They, they probably wouldn't have been able to hold the letter. They just listened, and then they stored it in their hearts as they were burned alive for the faith. So here's a challenge I want to make to the church as we get into the series. I would love for you to sit down with James and read it from the beginning to the end all in one sitting this week. So whether you're by yourself and you do it, wonderful. Whether you do it at your kitchen table with your family, even better. But I just want you to read it out loud. And I don't want you to turn on the TV. In fact, I want you to put your phone in a different room and I just want you to read it. And when you read it, here's a couple things I want you to look out for. I want you to look out for a couple truths that you're going to see as you read that out loud. One is this, when you read that out loud, notice that James is going to say suffering never surprises God and that he's there in the suffering. This is going to be a huge theme. Why? We just talked about why. Because there's suffering. And he's saying God is not surprised. It's not like he didn't have that planned in the sense of God knew the season you were going into, but he's enough. He will give you the peace you need to endure. And he doesn't promise that you won't go through those seasons. But he says, I'm enough. I will be there for you. Lean into me. So I want you to notice that theme. We also notice that he says that we will not not suffer. James is going to say, listen, you will suffer. It's a matter of time. But notice, James is going to say, but God will redeem your suffering. He'll redeem it. He will use it. It will be for his glory. There will be no more tears, no more suffering in eternity. Hold on and see it as something God is using to bear fruit in your life and to give him glory. He will redeem it. He will redeem it. And the early church who suffered is the reason we know Jesus. The reason we know Jesus in this room is because they suffered. Praise God for their endurance. Praise God that some point in my, my family's history, somebody loved my family enough to introduce my father to Jesus and was to be willing to be mocked in order to do so. Praise God for that person. Because I know Jesus because of them. Praise God for the, the men and women that have died in the cancer cell, cancer filled with cancer in the hospital rooms, but filled with joy and peace and satisfaction so that the nurse walks in and says, why are you not angry? You are, have more joy than I have, and I'm healthy. Praise God for that person, because there's a testimony to the nurse of how they handled that cancer. Amen? Anybody? The light of the Lord in the midst of suffering was bright. And it may change the lives of those around them. They were faithful to be used regardless of what was going on 
in their life. This is the theme. God is about progress, James is going to say, not about perfection. He's not saying you are loved if you're perfect. He says you are loved, now trust and obey. You are loved, now trust and obey. You will not earn my love. It is given to you freely. Did you hear me? You will not earn God's love. He is given to you freely. So when you say you are not enough, that is a lie. Because despite the fact that you were sinful, God says, I love you and I will pursue you. And so you are greater than your sin. You are more loved than the sin. Meaning, in grace, he doesn't even see the sin. So I can walk according to the standard God has for me, even if I've never walked according to the standards in my past. I was not faithful. I didn't say myself towards marriage. I feel guilty and shame because I knew I should have trusted in what God said, but I didn't. God says, grace abounds. Now walk and obey. You're forgiven. I love you. Now trust moving forward. This is the message of James. No, no, no. Grace abounds. I forgive you. Now trust moving forward. And I have joy for you. I have peace for you. I don't have shame and guilt. Stop looking backwards. Trust and obey from here to glory. This is where you're going to find fruits. This is where you're going to find your marriage being saved. This is where you're going to find joy coming into your life that you never had before. This is where you're going to find meaning in your work that you don't have any meaning in. Trust and obey. And then he's going to talk about worldly riches, and he's going to say, listen, those things never will satisfy you. It's the Solomon concept. There's never going to be a nicer car that's going to fill you. There's never going to be a better boyfriend, a better husband, better spouse, better children, better job. They will not satisfy your soul, James is going to say. Don't go for that trap. Don't go for that trap. Because at the end of that trap, you're going to look around with a nicer house and say, this is it. And your soul is going to be way back here starving because you compromised what God wanted for you to chase after something that you never needed in the first place. Don't go down that trap. Don't, God will provide for you. Be faithful. Walk out your purpose. Here's what James is going to encourage us to do. And so as your pastor, really, th this has been a convicting message for me as I prepared this series and as we're preparing the series. Man, it's, it's so much. When you read the book of James, and hopefully you do this week out loud, the biggest conclusion you make is like, I'm just not there. Like, I, Lord, like, yes, I just care about nice things a little too much. That's what you're going to feel. Lord, you know, I, I am a little bit too impatient there. Man, I, I do have these pride things that you got to continue to work on. And what you get from James is, no, 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 there's work to be done in your heart. You could be walking with the Lord. You can know the word of God. But until you're in glory, there is, there's growing to be done. There's things you got to give to the Lord. That's why when we do altar calls and we have prayer people, I don't have any idea why none of you guys come up. I mean, I have a list you should have a list. These are the things that sanctification, these are the things that the Holy Spirit's working in my life. Man, I just, I just want alcohol a little bit too much. And I need God to completely heal me of that, even though he's delivered me from a lot of things. Man, I just feel like I'm just, I'm chasing after that, that false dream too much. I spend too much time watching Netflix. I need to step away and do something more meaningful for my soul. This is what we should be wrestling with as James teaches us that there's more to life than comfort and riches. And he's been teaching me this. We can identify, okay, there's areas that we all need to work on because we love Jesus and he's able to give us victory in those things. And how many of you can testimony, how many of you can give testimony to this idea of, man, there are times in your life because of pride where you think you figured out the Christian life. Anybody? I have. It's like, okay, how many of you in your life had said something like this? Like, I know. I mean, I know. Like, um, hey, how many times have you read the Bible? Man, I've read the Bible front and back for 20 years. I've done my time in ministry. I used to serve. I've done my time. These, this language. That somehow you have arrived at a place where God's like, I'm done with you. You're good. Just wait it out. James will say, no, no, that doesn't exist. Faith will drive obedience. And obedience will grow you. And you never stop growing. 
you never stop reading your word. You never stop trusting in the Lord. You never say, my marriage is fully godly. Nope. You examine it. Lord, what are, what are the leaks? Spirit, I need more of you in that area of my life. You're constantly examining, am I walking and trusting fully in the spirit of God? Where are the leaks? And he says, no, 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 faith leads to obedience. Trust and obey, trust and obey. Every day you wake up in your life, you are to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Like, I'll just give you another testimony. I just moved into a new house. Remember that season of your life when you move into a new house and you're like, well, we need a nicer pillows. They don't match the curtains. This is the season I'm in. Oh, I like that dishwasher better than our other. Our other dishwasher was horrible, right? This is kind of weird, you know. And so you try to, you get nicer things. Oh, Amazon Prime, horrible, horrible invention. <laughs> nicer things. But, but I remember, I remember this past week, only been there for a week and a half. I remember stopping saying, okay, this is nice, but I still need Jesus. Because this isn't enough. And this, this will become a house, just like any other house. It will go from new house to just my house. It will go from new car to just my car. So I can't put treasure in here, and I'm quicker now to remember that it, some people, this is all they have. But I have Jesus. This isn't all I have, nor am I going to have any treasure in these things. Lord, you give them to me, you take them away, I still have you. So the more you learn in life, the less you treasure the things of this world, and you just lean into the Lord. And so you, he wants to give you good things, but he's the substance of all good things. There aren't the substance of all good things. You hear what I'm saying? I'm not content with those things without Jesus, but with Jesus, I don't need any of them. And it just reminded me of that. And so this is what we are to talk about. This is how we are to see the book of James, progress, not perfection. And so what I want to do here is I want to shift gears for the last couple minutes. I'm going to have the communion come uh, up forward, I'm going to have the band come back behind me, and we're going to shift in the time of communion. Now, as a church, I'd love to do communion once a month, first Sunday of every month, in case you want to prepare your hearts for it. Um, but what, what I'd like to do with communion is to challenge you with this. As we prepare communions and you grab your cups, remember what happened when Jesus ushered in this, this discipline to remember him. Jesus is sitting at the dinner table with the disciples, they have spent years with Jesus in ministry. They have seen him heal people. They have seen him do amazing things. And he's looking across and he's seeing James. Like, please look at me. Hear this. He's seeing his half-brother being omniscient, omnipresent. He knows how James will die. He knows that his, his, his brother will be bludgeoned to death. But he knows that the people he's looking at are going to get the promised spirit of God. And he's going to talk about that later. He's going to say, what I'm going to give you, i got to leave, but what I'm going to give you is greater than I. It's going to, it's going to be able to, you think, the things I'm doing, you're going to be able to do. And so he knows that they're going to have him with them. So they're going to have the power. But he also knows Peter's going to die. James. And he loves them. Jesus wept in scripture. He loves them. And so then he says, okay, he takes the bread, he takes the cup, and he says, okay, do these things. Like, like disciples, do, do these things after your brother in Christ is hung upside down. Do these things and remember me. Remember who I am. Remember what I've done. And remember that I will make all things new. And I am enough. And why does he say to remember? Because there will be seasons where you're like, God, are you there? And so when we do communion today, I want you to take all of those things in your life that you don't think God is there. Like, God, you are, you are at Emmanuel when I come on Sundays, but you're not in any other area of my life. My life is being destroyed right now. God, where are you? That feeling, and I want you when you take communion to remember that he's there. Remember what he's done. Remember that he's enough. Remember, are you leaning into him? Or are you trying to figure it out on your own? And in that moment, I want you to give it up to the Lord. I heard this, this um, celebrity's testimony this week on YouTube. 
I'm not going to give you the context of who he was, but I thought he did an amazing job of summing up what the gospel was. He said he was in rehab, and he was struggling, and his whole life was about him. And he says, as he read the gospels, it became a path for him. It became a path for him to get out of the suffering. And he says, the greatest way I can summarize the gospel is give it up. And I remember hearing that thinking, yes, that is the gospel. Give it up. He can take that. He wants to take that. And so will we come forward with the offering? And as we pass, we're just going to take a moment of silence to allow for you to give up what you need to give up to the one who can take it. And then we're going to remember together as a church. Jesus was sitting with his disciples. And he looked at his brothers and his sisters and the men and women that were going to spread the word of God all throughout the world. And he took the bread and he held it up and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, church. Will you partake in remembrance of me? you, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. In the same way, he took the cup and he held it up. He said, this is my blood poured out for you. I rescued you. So church, will we run to him? Embrace the redemptive plan on the cross that he gave us. The atoning work. Church, for those who are saved, do this in remembrance of him. Lord, help us to trust you more. Help us to obey you more. And help, help, us, help us to live in that grace while we do it. Father, I pray our hearts would be one of proper worship to you. That we would worship you this morning the way you deserve to be worshipped. And we thank you for the plan you have laid out to us for ultimate joy and happiness. We remember you this morning. We want to give you glory because you are alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.